Today, I'm talking to Marsha Bradley. Marsha is much published, but she is a debut novelist of a book called The Home for Wayward Girls, which has come out recently from HarperCollins to some wonderful reviews. Publishers Weekly calls it a stirring account of a teenage girl's escape from her abusive foster parents and her attempt to build a new life as an adult. Marsha helps writers complete manuscripts, pitch their books, and query literary agents. So if you're a writer and you'd like help with finishing your novel or your memoir and then pitching it to agents, then go and have a look at MarshaBradley.com and you'll find out um, what her latest classes are. She's also got a great newsletter. Um, I got a copy of it today and and there was a lovely little exercise about just taking a break. So, you know, I recommend signing up for that, even if, um, you know, if people aren't ready to do a manuscript, to do a whole novel or a memoir, you've got some great information there. So, Marsha, can I ask you, if, you know, looking at your newsletter made me think about the exercises that you give to writers. So can you tell us about that? quick exercise the one where you're saying try writing for minutes and not hours mm -hmm. yeah I think uh, thank you Tessa thanks for having me and um it's such a delight um and you read my newsletter that I really appreciate that um you know I think we get bogged down as writers in trying to find the right place to write the right time to write um, that we we have to book it on our diaries and our calendars. When I truly believe that, firstly, it's hard to get big blocks of time for most of us. We work, we have families, we run around, we have plenty of responsibilities. So what if you just look at it in terms of minutes? Um, and I will, two things. One, I feel better when I write. Um, every day and some days are too busy and I then I don't feel good. I feel like I've I've not taken my vitamins for the day um, if I don't write. So I have like this morning I was super busy. I had tons of things to do. But I had this thought in my head that I needed to do something for this character named Cal that I'm working on, that um, I needed to show something about her and I hadn't done it. And I and I've got this thing. It's almost a full manuscript. But it was in my head. I have to do that. I have to do that. And so 10 minutes, I sat down 10 minutes, wrote two paragraphs into a section that's already there about her. And, and then I was like, I did it. I felt as good as if I'd written a chapter, as good as if I'd written 3000 words, and I probably wrote 200 words. Um, so I think we need to give ourselves a break, realize that we don't often have hours, but we might be able to squeeze in 20 minutes here or there. And one thing I suggest people do is always end with like half a sentence so that when you come back to your desk, suddenly you have five more minutes something, you have to wait for something to cook, <laughs> run into that room, you have five more minutes and then add to that sentence. If we keep ourselves giving ourselves those kinds of hints, oh, this is where I was, just pick right up. Um, we can write a book. We can write a whole book in snippets. Does that mean your document is always up on your screen on a laptop nearby? It is. My, my, my um, document is, is usually always open and plus, I throughout the week send myself, I email myself a copy. I often upload a copy onto Google Docs as well. And I, I do have a cloud backup, but I were I always worry. The I recently had something where I thought everything had disappeared and I knew it was there. I knew I had a cloud backup. I knew it, I didn't have to worry, but still it scared me so much that you know might lose 60,000 words. So um have it open and send yourself copies. What's the harm? Email yourself a copy. Yeah. yeah. So I want to just pause for a minute on something that you've said to me before, which is that you once said to me that writing is like drinking for you. <laughs> so either that me, I don't know what that says about drinking, but <laughs> well, tell me what you mean by that. And then tell us how you achieve that. Mm -hmm. So, um, I 
really do feel that it's a healthy addiction. Um, it's like, if you like to exercise or walk, it's a good addiction. Um, I love writing. And, and when I say that I don't feel okay, if I don't write, I truly don't feel okay. Um, I um, physically can feel that I haven't written. Um, that's why it's so important, even if I only have 10 minutes for that two paragraphs about Cal to get those in. Um, so I have a rhythm every day I write in the morning, pretty much every single day. It's the first thing I do. Um, and sometimes it gets delayed till the evening because I'm teaching and I'm pretty busy or things like that. But in the main, again, even if I write just a little bit in the morning and leave myself at a place where that evening I'll be able to pick right back up. I think if when you finish a chapter and you're facing a blank page, that's the most difficult. So write two more sentences, but I write every day and then I feel good. I feel like, oh, I've done my part. So does that mean, do you remember a time when it didn't feel like that? And if you do, what's the difference now? Um, I think that for me, when I don't feel like that is if I don't have a project going on. Um, if I'm not in the middle of writing a book. So I'm always trying to think ahead to my next book. Um, I have files. They're really fun. Um, like I have a file called Titles. And I just, whenever I get, I think, well, that would be a good title for a book. I write it down. Um, I have first sentences, a file of first sentences for books. And I just write those. Um, and those could be for a book or a short story. So that I, if I'm lost, if I'm thinking, I don't have anything to do today, which during the process of, of the Home for Wayward Girls, there were months when Harper Collins had the book and I needed to be doing something. Um, and you're sitting there waiting, waiting for edits. Um, it's kind of tough to get your head around something. So I would just go into a file and grab one of those first sentences and try and write a story. I have these piles of short stories around the house someday I'll, I'll get to them but it's it doesn't matter it's the energy around writing it it's not it doesn't matter what I produce as much as that I'm doing it um, I can't imagine not having not writing um, sometimes I'll get invited to some kind of of a family event or something like that and my mind immediately thinks will I be able to write how am I going to write in the morning? But I'm really lucky with my family. My brother, my brother, Tom in Chicago, when I'm there, he'll, I've actually heard him when I'm in my guest room with the door closed. I've heard him say to people, she's writing right now. Um, <laughs> and, and so they, they respect that repast of mine that I have to go write. So do you still have the feeling when you start, at, well, two things, do you always leave a sentence half done or do you forget that sometimes? I either, I either leave a sentence half done or I write the whole sentence, but it's not a finished chapter. So you're in the middle of the action, you know mm -hmm. what to come back and do. And if you finish the action and then you'll start a new chapter just to get it started before yes. you to flow and it can even be just the words the next day that's all the next day dot 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 um or it could be um i have this this uh trick if it's okay about tension um i i don't know that this is true for all writers but i think many of us like to solve problems um as writers and, and that's what we do in our writing we're looking for the solution to whatever's going on um in many ways we're uh, very uh, mother earth um, cancer i think is the mo is mother earth we're very mother earthly um and so at the end of chapters um what i feel many writers have a tendency to do when they're working on on manuscripts is they solve the problem in the chapter and and i recommend not solving it and usually, very often, I go through people's manuscripts all the time, and I just move three sentences. So the last three sentences of a chapter are usually the resolution to the problem in that chapter. So instead of resolving it, I say move those three sentences to the next page. That's your new chapter. That's tomorrow's project. 
And so it could be as simple as something like, um, you know, she stared at the knife on the counter when he said that. Um, and there you end the chapter. Perfect. But then what we often do is add, and he said, aren't you going to cut the birthday cake? And then it's over. You've just, you've just lost the tension. So all you have to do is leave it with, she stared at the knife on the counter and everybody's wondering, and then you turn the next page and then person can say, well, aren't we going to cut the birthday cake? And it's, it's resolved, but you've left tension. You've left your reader hanging and they have to turn the page. They have to know what happens with that knife. Um, and so if you go through your books very often, just move a few sentences to the next page. And then the next day you have something to work on. So that's a great tip. And you've still got character change or change of some kind in the chapter apart from that. So the chapter on its own is still working. You just don't need quite as much as you thought you did. And I think, you know, you have also, you, you know, again, you want your reader, you, you don't want your reader to always be tense. And, and there are ways to measure your tenseness throughout all your chapters. But you do want some high level of tension um, every few chapters or so. And again, as this Mother Earth, we say, oh, I'll solve it right now so they don't worry. But you want your reader to worry. <laughs> um, you want your reader to wonder what's going to happen. You want the reader to wonder, are they okay? Um, and so I just say, stop resolving everyone's problems and move a few to the next page. So that's really helpful, I think, because we do write to fix things. And so that is the natural inclination. So when you are writing, do you still feel maybe this isn't good enough? Maybe this chapter isn't good enough. My sentence isn't good enough. Do you have those feelings or not? <laughs> oh, never. <laughs> um, I do. However, I I don't um I don't throw a lot out, and I uh, even if I cut something, I put it into a folder to make into an excerpt or a story and try and publish it somewhere else. Um, however, um, I think if we think about word count, so a lot of times people will say, "Well, I'm only at okay." So I'm only at 40,000 words, or I'm only at 60,000 words, and I want to have 70, or I want to have whatever number it is. And, and so we start tacking on. We, we think, oh, wait, I can have them go to the circus. Yes, let's write a chapter about the circus. And then we think, oh, well, while they're at the circus, he breaks his arm. Okay, let's go to the hospital. And we just keep adding on and adding on instead. And maybe that's where we find 10,000 words. But I say, instead of doing that stop, and I literally did this to myself recently, I stopped myself and said, you're doing that thing. You're just tacking on, you're tacking on scenes and you're adding more subplots and who is isn't this fascinating? Just stop it. Take the 50,000 words you have, go back to your very first sentence and deepen, just deepen every sentence. Every time you think that's a lazy sentence, make it better. You think all you said was uh, she turned around and answered him. Could you say something else? Turned. How many times have you used turned in this book? Um, are there different ways? On her heel, did a 180, um, screeched to a stop, whatever it is. But add more, not just to add more words, but add more depth. And, and your book becomes so much better and you didn't need the circus and you didn't need the hospital. <laughs> so you do you have the thought this is going to need deepening never mind I'll do it later on do you have that thought I always have that thought it's always there so I the way that I um in the morning when I get up to write and <clears throat> even though I have that page that's waiting with a half a sentence I usually go back about three to five pages and that's where I start because I, I know that just what you just said, I need to paint in more details. I need to add more nuance. I need, um, I, I've got to stop with, you know, the in the dialogue, make the dialogue more interesting. Um, check the words, check my points of view. Have I switched 
without, you know, realizing it have I gone from third person to something else. Um, and so I do that every day constantly. So I go back three to five pages, right? probably past another five pages. The next day, same thing, back three to five pages. And I just continue like that. That's how I write every day. Right. And does it feel sort of meditative, you know, that you've got this rhythm and you've made space for it in your life and so you can rely on it? Is that what it is? Yes, it, it's that. And it's also like, I was thinking about this a lot. And what did I read? Um, uh, oh, I read a couple of things and I listened to um, City Lights has has a good um, uh, some interviews and they had an interview with George Saunders and um, and one of the things he said, which which I think is what we should all be thinking about um, is not to have your characters do what we um, expect them to do, um, what we would predict them to do. And not to think that this is difficult, not to think you're in charge of that. So you just write up to that point and then let the character surprise you, the writer, which is really fun. And as a part of that, to your question about how is it for me, I've been thinking a lot lately about how we get so involved with um, wanting accolades not just from, not big accolades, accolades from our friends, accolades from anyone who writes, reads what we write. And the meditative process is being happy with yourself. Mm -hmm. Saying, I love this. Mm -hmm. I love this sentence. I love this moment. Um, I have, in, in the book I'm working on right now, there's two little kids and I love them. Mm -hmm. And I don't know them. And, um, and, I've made them up and they're going to be, they, they are the heroes of this story. Um, and I love writing about them, no matter what happens, no matter what happens with the book, no matter what happens with, with um, uh, the future of my writing. Um, I'm so happy when I'm writing this story and it's not even, it's a tragic story. <laughs> uh oh, but I'm happy. I'm very happy while I'm writing it because there are happy there are happy moments and there's a lot of bravery and a lot of wonder. Um, but I have to feel good. At the end of this manuscript, I have to just feel good with the whole thing. And then, and I have said this so many times, people who know me will say, I've been saying this for years and I don't even know where I got it. But I say, eventually you have to be finished and you have to put your manuscript on a boat. And I actually do this and I go, put it on a boat and let it go. You have to let it go. And it'll, it'll sail where it will sail. And I, th I think it's very, very important um, for all of us to be our own judges of our writing. At the end of the day, do you feel good? Yeah, mm -hmm. do you feel like you've worked hard? Do you feel, are you proud? Um, would you be proud to give this to someone? Um, and then the rest of it is all, you know, there's a lot that goes on in the business of publishing. It's no. not personal. No, that's right. So one of the things I've heard is that um, you don't believe in the middle of books. What do you mean by that? Doesn't there have to be a midpoint and a climax, all of that? You know, I and and I was thinking about that. So, you know, there's lots of structures for books that 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 can be taught. Um, the probably one of the most known is the three act structure. You know, there's a inciting incident. There is a midpoint, there is a climax, denouement. There you go, one, two, three. And that midpoint. However, oftentimes people, you've heard it, Tess, people say, I'm stuck in the middle. Um, I don't know what to do. I'm in the middle. Or they, or it's the horrible middle. It's the awful middle. And, and so who wants to be writing something that's the awful in the middle? Um, who wants to be pain in pain? So what I think of is just, Right. Think of your book as just a um, a, a two-sided mountain. It's a mountain. You got to get to the top. And you got to get to the bottom, mm -hmm. um, and just write to and 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 by that I actually mean if you imagine. All right. So my book is going to be two hundred and eighty pages long. Just pick whatever number you want it to be. 
That means 140 pages in and 140 pages out. So stop thinking in those threes, you know, beginning, middle, end, and just say, okay, I'm going to write my first 140 pages, and then we're uh, then we're over the hill, and we're going to write the other 140 pages. I'm going to have 280 pages, um, and I think if we think in terms of pages or word count, whatever works for you, um, instead of this, what's going to be the climax? What's going to be the climax? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Then we go to George Saunders. Don't worry about it. Mm. It'll happen. What he was, what he said is, if you're thinking about it, I think I can. I'm probably misquoting him, but if you're thinking about it, you're overthinking. So right. just write it and um, and see where it goes. Um, and he has a wonderful quote about causality. You know, the difference between a published author and an unpublished author is very often understanding causality in plot that this thing leads to the next thing and that le led to the next thing is that do yes you, yeah. do you see that um do you have students coming into your advanced novel and memoir class who do they all know about causality or do you have to teach that do you teach that so so um that's one of the things i have a class coming up with with um and we call it the test class uh but we have a bunch of tests they're fun though um they're tests about what do you know about your character and we just ask a whole bunch of questions uh, uh, about plot what's the inciting incident people don't even necessarily know that term um inciting incident um what has to be on the first page um, and all these things sound so cut and dry. It has to be, it has to be. However, these are really just things to think about for two reasons. One, your story has to have a story. There does have to be a story going on. There has to be conflict. There has to be a challenge. There has to be obstacles that get overcome. Uh, it's, it's Odysseus. You have to throw things at your character. Throw it, throw it, throw it. Make it really difficult for that character to get to the last page. That's important. Um, but also in terms of we want to be published. So we get past that. I'm just going to be happy with it. We then go, I want to be published. Well, there, an agent or a publisher is going to, an editor is going to ask you, well, what's the, what's the inciting incident? What's the problem? What's the question asked on the first page of your book? Um, what is the question that gets solved by the end of the book? Um, and if you haven't thought about these things, they may be in your book, but you're sitting there kind of going, uh, 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 let me think. So in my classes, I really do um, focus with um, in the advanced memoir and, and novel class and also in the test class just on let's get our ducks in a row let's think about these things and if you don't have an inciting incident but you have a really good book it's not hard to put one in there just, just go in and write it in that the door fell off the hinges and that's a problem mm -hmm. um, and it's going to get solved by the end of the book but just thinking these ways also, it's like, you know, Tessa, because we're writers. Um, I, I remember when I started saying to people, I'm a writer. And a lot of us still don't do that. It's hard. We, we say, oh, I'm writing something mm -hmm. or I'm trying to write um, or I have this thing in my desk I'm kind of working on. Just being brave enough to say I am a writer. Amen. It changes everything. When my book, the, the Home for Wayward Girls came out and you, you saw it, probably some other people did too. I have these little notebooks I gave to people that um, they're just tiny little field notebooks, basically, um, with a picture of the book on the cover. I took them everywhere. I took them to my mammogram and gave them to <laughs> to all the radiologists and the nurses. I took them to my dentist's office and all my dental staff came to one of my launches. Um, uh, it also, I, I, I take them everywhere, but you have to be proud. You have to, and then people say, well, what is it about? You have to have an answer for that. <laughs> Let me just ask you on a practical note. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about the book in, in a bit more detail in just a second. 
But when you are having people get their ducks in a row, do you recommend they use Google Docs or Scrivener or OneNote? What, how do you recommend they keep the material easily accessible? You know, I do think Google Docs is great because you won't lose it. Mm -hmm. And um, and one of the challenges with the C drive in, in Microsoft Word is eventually there's so much in there, it's hard to find something. Um, so I do think that's good. I also think that Scrivener is great if you're that kind of person. And we're all different kinds of people. Um, some of us are analytics. There's all these ways to break down personality types. Um, what are you? Um, if you're an analytic, if you're, you know, if you could have been an engineer in a different life, then then, you know, structurally lay it out. Um, the old um, Anne Lamott bird by bird method, she had had it all on index cards and she close pinned those to a rope over her head that she could move. So she could constantly find the parts of her book. Um, but you do need some system. Uh, my, my recommendation when you're um, writing your book is even if your chapters are just numbers, one, two, three, four, seven, 20. Put a phrase by each. It won't stay in the book necessarily, but it can. it's a phrase that will be for you a hint as to what that chapter is about. Um, just, a, just a phrase that's something, you know, boy meets girl, girl meets boy, um, person gets murdered, train crashes, whatever it is, something in those. And then when you're finished with your book, you can take a spreadsheet, if you're a spreadsheet type, if you're not, take a sheet of paper, put all those down, one chapter one to 40 with that phrase, and you have your outline. Then you have your book outline. And you can add more sections and you can add more detail. But what I say to people is have that ready. Because let's say, as can happen, um, as did happen at the re recent pitch conference, people get asked, um, oh, I like it. I think that's an agent says that's an it's interesting. I like it. Send me uh send me fifty pages and your outline, mm -hmm. as if you have an outline. <laughs> and it takes a long time to write an outline. If you have a 70, 80,000 word manuscript and you're going to go through that page by page, so here you've already got it started. Just list the chapter numbers, list those phrases. And, and maybe add, um, I say, add a column that says to do. I'm going to add this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to add more. I'm going to take this out. I'm going to move this to another section. Just like that. That's a simple outline that you can send to an agent or a public, an editor, and they can use it. And they can go come back to you and say, let's do this, 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 and this. But prepare ahead of time because we cannot, you cannot do it all. I, I know, you know. The, the minute the book is suddenly coming out, it's very hard to, to suddenly, oh, I'll write an outline and I'll also develop social media and I'll get a following of people. It's really difficult to do. So do the most you can ahead of time. And would you, um, I'll talk about Pitch Fest in just a second so that people know what that is, but would you also add a section for tracking character change in that outline? I think it's good and I, I would. And I would also, I also add tension. What's the level of tension, one to five? And so what I say to people you can do, so you have your 40 or 50 chapters and five is high tension and one is low tension. Just look at it. If you've got 40 chapters and they're all level one or two, is your reader going to be awake? <laughs> now, if, they, if they're all five, you better be passing out heart medication. So, you know, it should be just sit on a, 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 one of those electrocardiogram machines. It should be a wave so that sometimes your reader can breathe. And sometimes the reader is going, oh my God, what's going to happen on the next page? And there's your knife in the kitchen. Right. And so just pe so that people know, um, we do, we are doing four pitch fests a year. Marsha and I are running them in tandem with the Westport Library in Connecticut. So you could either go to MarshaBradley.com or you can go to Bloom Writers and get more information and sign up and be kept in the know about that. That's where people pitch their books to literary agents. And Marsha also has a class where she'll help people write their query letters and get prepared for that. So 
Okay. And, but that to, to that test, so just to add, when we, when again, practice, like practice now while you're writing your book, pull out themes so that when the day comes and someone says, well, what are the themes in your book? You're not scratching your head. You're saying, well, there's, there's a, a fam dysfunctional family. There's abuse. There's um, a love that goes wrong. You have your themes ready to talk about. Start to talk about your books now. Talk to people at the grocery store. Talk to your person at your doctor's appointment. They People love books. Excuse me, I want to tell you about my book. So that's a perfect segue into your book, The Home for Wayward Girls. <laughs> Let's talk about the themes because tell us about Loretta. Tell us where she begins what her life is like as a child and then what she goes on to. So the um the book is The Home for Wayward Girls and it's it's a dual timeline book in that there are sections when Loretta is 17 and she is living on a ranch west of the Rockies and it's a ranch that her parents own and run. It's a home for wayward girls. And people all over the United States ship their, their kids, their teens off to these places, in this case, young women. Um, and she's lived there all her life. So this is the only life she's known. Um, and then the other part of the book, um, thank goodness, is she's an adult and she's in her thirties and she's made it to New York. She did escape. She hitchhikes across country thanks to some wonderful kind helpful people um prospers in new york goes to hunter college uh decides to work with runaways and homeless people and uh and she's she's um as happy as one could be considering what she's gone through in her life um and she's doing good work um Loretta, I was thinking about this today. I was like, who is Loretta uh, in, in my head? Um, and um, she's, I, the first line of the book, which I always talk about the, the significance of first lines and first sentences. Um, and the first sentence of the book is simply, Loretta was an independent woman. And that's it. And I, that was not happenstance. That was thought about a lot, that sentence. Uh, it was said as a marker for anyone reading the book to know that Loretta, whether she's 17 or at that point when she's an adult, she is a sole survivor. She is a individual. No one, uh, people may have helped her along the way. Uh, people, Some people were good to her, some were not, but this was her journey. She made a decision early on in her life at the ranch that she was leaving. And she made a decision that she was going to New York. She didn't know anything about New York. They don't have television on the ranch. She doesn't have a computer, uh, but she knows she's going to New York City. And uh, and so there are, you know, like she does eventually get married. She does have a good life. However, no one should ever think that she got where she got other than on her own two feet. Um, and And so... I loved writing that because I'm in her head. I'm in third person close in this book, which means we're seeing everything through Loretta's eyes. We can't see what's behind her. We can only see what's in front of her, what she can hear, what she can touch. Um, and she's a very good narrator, in my opinion. She tells the story very well. It's not in first person, though, which gives us a little bit bigger view of the room when she's standing somewhere. Um, uh, she doesn't have any friends because she's always lived on this ranch and the other girls who come and stay there as residents leave. So all her life, the only other women, young women she's known, uh, eventually they get to leave. And there's uh, both as much as she cares about these people who are her friends, she also is jealous of them. They get to leave. She's envious. They're going home. They talk about places like the Target store. She's never been to a Target. They talk about Walmart. Um, they talk about music on the radio. She, she's, you know, she doesn't know that world at all. Um, when they come to the ranch, they're wearing guest jeans. Um, and she dreams of having guest jeans. Uh, she wears a, a denim skirt, that, a wraparound skirt that's the uniform there. 
So it's the story of this very independent young woman becoming an independent, uh, mature woman and what she goes through to get there. And, um, and I think I was thinking about the ending today and the ending is great. The ending is her resolve. It's her showing who she is and her resolve with her life. Um, it's not happy or sad. It's hopeful. Mm -hmm. It's just hopeful that, that life does improve that things do get better. So in terms of the themes, did you think about that in the very beginning? And how many different themes would you say you've got in the book? Yeah, um, great. I think um, there's the theme of uh, that I really like today, which is um, found family, um, that her own family um, doesn't even deserve the word family. Um, it's just her father and her mother who run this horrible place and uh, abuse and use these young women. Uh, but there are other people who I would say are her family. Uh, there's a teacher at school, Miss Dell, who um, one of my favorite quotes, and this is just fantastic. Um, uh, she helps her along the way. And at one point says to Loretta, um, friendship has no expiration date. And that, so that is one of the themes that good friends are forever. And one of my readers at a, um, at a recent book club uh, sent me this. And so you kind of can read it, but sent me the quote that she made into a sign. Friendship okay. has no expiration. So cool. Um, I was so touched by that. Um, the, the other one is about um, pride pride in who we are, no matter what we are, or where we come from. Um, and that we don't hide, we don't hide what we come from. Um, and uh, there's a quote in the book, um, where one of the, uh, where Loretta's giving a talk, and she says, we can't put what we are in a box. And someone brought that up to me just recently, how much that meant to them that we are all our flaws. We are all of the things that we carry through our life that have been tacked onto us one by one by one. We carry those. And I love that about this book that Loretta is not perfect. And she she's a, a hero, not by choice, but just by the fact of her life being what it is. So we have that. And then and then there's survival. Yeah. Survival is the other thing, getting through no matter what. And um, and finding a way and knowing that if you look, there will there are people who will help you when you need help. And was that was hitchhiking part of the survival theme? Was what hitchhiking? It was. Um, I had a hard, I had a difficult like a, I had a moment of consternation over the hitchhiking um, because. You know, it's certainly something I wouldn't want to hear my daughters tell me that they're they're about to hitchhike across country. Um, uh, sometimes we have no choice, and um, and I I have hitchhiked across country, uh, but this was years ago, and there were a lot of people hitchhiking at that time, so I felt a little more safe than maybe I would today. Um, so there's a moment in the book where Loretta has been hitchhiking. And it hasn't all gone smoothly, but it's gone okay. And she's getting there. She's she's getting through Nebraska and on her way to New York. And um, then and then I just felt it was necessary. So there's a chapter where she says, "Not that I would recommend hitchhiking." And I I, I put that in just as a as a you know a cautionary word from from your narrator. Um, but that sometimes it is necessary. Um, and um, there is the most wonderful moment when she is crossing the George Washington Bridge. Um, she's gotten a ride um, across the bridge and she doesn't even know that she's entering New York and she can see this big city and it's so Wizard of Oz seeing the, the big city across the, the river. And, um, uh, and it's just delightful when she realizes, oh, my God, I'm, I've made it. I'm in New York City. And this driver of this car is kind of offering her a little help. And he wasn't nothing bad about him. But she finally says, no, I'm fine because she needs to stand there alone. And so, again, it's that survival on our own. Mm -hmm. So that's I, I love the honoring that you've done of this character's journey. You know, it, it feels like it, it's a really respectful and sincere 
telling of her story. So I know you've had a lot of questions and opinions about your book's ending. So can you talk about what the final, without giving a spoiler, um, what the final chapter means to you? And is it meant to have meaning for other writers? Is that the case? Yeah, um, you know, it's hard to end a book like this. Um, you know, her her father has has gone to jail at the end of the book, and that's not a, you know, not to give away. Um, he's a pretty evil person, and her mother has died. Um, she doesn't really have any family that she knows of yet to speak of. Um, uh, and um, I think that 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 the ending is that it's that's okay that it's perfectly okay to to just stand in your own shoes and be proud of who you are and that you're not necessarily deliriously happy you're not sad um i think that at the end of this book i love the ending because it's in its own way she isn't just giving herself a new beginning but she's given the land she came from, like a new, like a rebaptism, if you will, that it can be a good place instead of a memory of so much badness that was in her life. But I also think, love that question you asked, thank you, about for other writers, that sometimes there isn't, an, you know, there's not a perfect ending. Um, that we don't have to think there has to be um if you're writing a romance, there does have to be, but if you're, but in general, you know, a book can end and just let people think. And what I love is people who come up to me at readings and they tell me things about the ending and it's their own, it's their own supposition. And I, and I think that's fantastic. They, they, they tell me what it means. And that's more because that's what the ending means to them. Uh, They've told me things about what happened to her father that aren't in the book, um, but that's perfectly fine because that's what you want your readers to do. You want them to make more out of the story than you did. A um, lot of different versions of, of what she discovers near the end of the book. And, and again, they're all right. They're all right. That's fascinating. Yeah. So people can really bring their own experience to what's on the page. All right, so run, don't walk to your bookseller of choice, The Home for Wayward Girls, Marsha Bradley's debut novel, and go to marshabradley.com to find out about her classes so that you can get your debut novel or memoir published. Thank you so much, Marsha. Thank you. This has been a delight. You're just the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Take care.